NetCredit is here to say yes because you're more than a credit score. Apply in minutes and get a decision as soon as the same day. Loans offered by NetCredit or lending partner banks and serviced by NetCredit. Application subject to review and approval. Learn more at netcredit.com slash partners. NetCredit. Credit to the people. Sometimes it takes a different approach to help you unlock your true potential. Capella University's game-changing FlexPath format helps you learn at your own pace and fit earning a degree into your life. From before you enroll to after you graduate, you'll be supported by people who are invested in your success so you can pursue your goals knowing that help is available if you need it. Imagine your future differently at capella.edu. Yesterday, we talked all about how James Randolino started a hedge fund, which was a fraud, a Ponzi scheme, all the illegal activity, how he went from civil to criminal. This one starts with James going to jail and what happened afterwards. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show. And l- let me ask you a couple of questions. Like, sure. So, hey, did when you came back from the park and you you didn't kill yourself, fortunately, what did you tell your girlfriend? Well, so I had I had left my wallet, my my uh, you know my watch, uh, everything kind of like on on the table. Um, I had written a bunch of letters and I'd written one to her, and uh, she actually worked for a very very large hedge fund, which used to be based in in chicago now is based in florida i should not tell you yes uh she uh, but she was not in trade she was on the uh on the uh the it side as a dba anyway so you know she she saw the letter and she read it and um you know she called my parents and you know all that stuff and you know let them know what was going on so when i got back there she knew exactly what was going on and she was just you know dumbfounded and i just said you know this is what i gotta do i've gotta you know i've gotta you know contact a lawyer and turn myself in what did your parents say to you? Uh, well, since, uh, I mean, they were investors, unfortunately. And um, I mean, to this day, not, I don't have kids. Um, so I don't understand unconditional love, James. Um, I just don't understand how they could have been so overwhelmingly supportive at the time as as they were. And did anyone go with you when you turned yourself in? Uh, no, at that time, no, no. So it was basically just going to, um, you know, going to the, 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 the federal building and, you know, walking in there with an attorney and, and doing that. And then probably 10 days later, when I went, uh, I went in front of a magistrate judge and the, you know, judge is like, well, let's talk about your bail. I'm like, your honor, I don't want bail. I want to be incarcerated. He kind of gives me one of those looks, right? He goes, you're sure, right? I'll, I'd be happy to give you bail. I know you're not going anywhere. And like, no, I want to be incarcerated. So it, both of those times, no, I was by myself. And is that because you were you were still you were pretty depressed and you were worried if you were on your own, you would you would continue the job of killing yourself? Yeah, I and and what I have, you know, I don't know, but um there's probably a pretty good chance that that I might have been successful, yes. At this point, had you considered coming clean with your investors before turning yourself in? Um at at, at that point, no. Because no. Maybe they all would have said, listen, don't turn yourself in. Well, this was really bad, but we'll deal with it. And I don't know. I don't know what could happen. Yeah. But. Well, you know, if if I had 10 or 15 clients, um, if I had my initial set, it probably, even though I, I had done criminal activities, uh, there was definitely a chance that I could have maybe, you know, said, you know, look, if I go, if I go to prison, um, you know, nobody's getting any money back, right? Or you're going to get very, very little. So let, let's work something out. I'll get a job. I'll go back to my MBA and I'll, you know, be in debt to you guys for, you know, for for years and years and years. But, you know, we'll work it out. And probably the majority, if not all, might have agreed might have agreed to that. Um, but at that point, you know, no, I when I decided to go to, to, the, to the feds, I, no, absolutely not. And, and this is kind of a, a, a more, you know, aiding and abetting type of question, but during the financial crisis of 2008, late 2007, you know, early 2008, early or all 2008, 
and then early 2009, could you have somehow said to your investors, listen, I got caught in all the crossfire with all the bonds. I made a mistake. I lost everything. Could you have artificially come clean? Um, you know, if I hadn't lost as much money as I had, I probably could have said, because you remember, you know, the volatility um, during that time, even, you know, before Madoff, you know, when, when Lehman falling, I mean, you know, the, the Dow, the, the the trading range in the Dow went from, you know, 150, 200 points. I mean, there was eight, 9,000 point daily swings in that. And I probably could have um, use that as an excuse to to show some losses and say, hey, we're going to close it up and okay, this is going to be the final loss. And yeah, I I probably could have pulled it up, but at that point I was I was down so much. I mean, if I was down, you know, 30, 40, 50 percent, I probably could have used that as an excuse and say, hey, we're down 25 percent and let's just close it up and and I'm done, right? But it just didn't work out that way. How, how big did the investors think the fund was? Um, probably about. Four hundred million dollars. Oh my gosh! So that's well, and and it, it's something that we should kind of talk about because you know most of my investors were high net worth business guys, right? And they were very very intelligent investors. That you know some of them did their own due diligence, and a lot of them hired CPAs and attorneys to do their due diligence for them as well. So they were they were you know visiting my office, looking at the back office, looking at at records going through my my hedge fund documents, um, et cetera, et cetera. And nobody ever, ever, ever figured it out. And it's, you know, to this day, I'm just so surprised that some of the things that I told them that they couldn't figure out, you know, what was going on. I'll give you an example. Three, four months after the fund started, I get a phone call. Hey, a few of us are sitting around, you know, do you have audited financial statements? Well, sure. Uh, well, we'd like to get, you know, a copy of those. Well, sure, yeah, I'll, I'll give my CPA firm a call and, you know, I'll get them for you. Thinking, God, what am I going to do? How am I going to get, you know, audited statements? So what do you do? I go to my friend, you know, Google and type in, you know, hedge fund audited financial statements dot PDF and, you know, get probably seven, eight different examples. And I find one that's, you know, that's trading securities and I make some modifications and, you know, come up with a false, you know, a false audit firm name, um, a false, you know, uh, CPA who signs it. Um, and send them out and nobody ever, ever verified that the CPA or the firm um, was valid. And there were so many mistakes in over the years in the in these fake audits that I sent out that nobody ever figured it out. And I just can't, you know, I, I, I just can't believe it. That, that is so fascinating, really. I mean, when I, I, so I ran a fund of hedge funds around that time as well, and we would always make sure we got the audited statements from the CPA and like we would talk to the CPA and, but you know, I also, I also invested in some funds that I later learned might not have been full scams, but with a little more work, I was able to see they were, they were investing in companies they started and things like that. So different types of scams, but there were so many scams going on then. Like the hedge fund industry was not as mature then as it is now. Now the scams are really clever. So, oh, it's it, I, and it just it's some of the stuff that I see just you know just never ceases to amaze me. But you know, uh, you know, a big red flag that should have been caught from the very moment. So everybody, you know, one of my big sales points it was in my sales literature and in my in my documents that a you know a third party CPA firm would be computing all of the returns. I would never touch the numbers. Right? They go right from the C, from the the broker for monthly statements to the CPA firm, the CPA firm directly to to my investors. And of course, I, I buy the software, the, the hedge fund accounting software. So I'm sending the statements um, on my letterhead with um, the return address with uh, on my business envelopes, right? So they weren't coming from the CPA firm. Nobody ever ever questioned that. And probably one of the one of the biggest James, and it's just amazing to me. So um, a few days. Uh, into 2004, which had been the one year mark of the, or the the, the, the beginning of the following year of the fund, I, I get a, a phone call from one of my investors. Hey, when, when are you, um, when are you guys sending out the tax forms? Mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, oh my God, what, what am I going to do? I've never thought about this. It's bad enough. Now I understand I'm probably down, I, whatever it was, 25% at the time. I, I don't remember. Um, and, and 
I'm going to make it back, but you know, I'm committing fraud, but there's no way I'm going to, I'm going to commit tax fraud, right? Or whatever that is. If I'm going to send, you know, false tax statements out, I go, I go, let me, let me find out from my CPA firm and, 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 and I'll call you back. And what I ended up telling these guys, and for years, not only did they believe it, but their CPAs and attorneys believed it. So on the future side, and you may know this, so futures have a kind of a somewhat preferred tax status. So everything is short-term capital gains, right? Um, but on, on the future side, uh, I, I believe 40% of the profits can be taxed as long-term capital gains. So that there's an advantage there. But what I basically told everybody was that, you know, if as long as the money stays in the fund, you don't pay tax. It's not a taxable event. And I can't tell you over the years, probably six or seven different different CPAs and or attorneys, both on the phone, over lunch, over dinner, um, explaining this. And, you know, it's just, it, it, it's amazing that nobody called one of their colleagues. Hey, I got this guy, Brangolino, he's got this hedge fund. He, he, this is what he's telling my client, that there's no taxable event, you know, in, in terms of, you know, profits. And, you know, the guy was saying, well, he's nuts unless it's, it's, it's in a IRA account, right? There, there, there's absolutely no way that you don't pay tax on it. And um, nobody ever, ever caught up on that. So they, they people just did not do their due diligence. Well, I'm, I guess they had their own kind of wishful thinking that maybe they didn't even want to ask more questions because then they preferred listening to what you told them. That, and they could always just say, well, that's what he told me if, if, they're, if the IRS came to them. I, absolutely. But, you know, even even so with, with their CPs and, and attorneys who looked at this stuff, I mean, I'm talking, you know, having a, a, a 10 minute conversation or a 15 minute conversation with a CPA and trying to explain to them, you know, basically that it's not a taxable event. I mean, I just don't understand what what, what they were thinking. I mean, you know, a, a hedge fund is either a limited partnership or, or it's an LLC. It's all passed through. And I remember sitting at the Union League Club with 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 two CPAs and one of my one of my investors, and we're sitting there and and um, we're getting ready to leave. And my investor goes to one of the CPAs, "Hey, I, I, are you are you comfortable with what you know what, what Jimmy told you?" He goes, "Yeah, but I, I just can't understand how you know how this how this entity does not have to pay tax." I mean, it it was right it was right there on the tip of his tongue, and he didn't think that he would call somebody that he knew, you know, one of his colleagues who knew something about hedge funds. To say, hey, no, it's all passed through. Oh my gosh! Well, and you know, four hundred million dollars—that was a pretty hefty amount at that time to to raise. Like, correct? How were you able to raise that? I mean, that's a, a what was your what was the biggest investment made in your fund? Uh, so five, so five hundred thousand was uh, was the largest. Yeah, I I, I raised. Um, I raised uh, just about yeah, just about four million dollars through the through the whole period. Oh, four million, not four hundred million. Well, that that no, that that's what I said on my audited statements. Because uh, on on the audited financial statements, you know, it, it shows you know, um, basically they're they're auditing for you know for the existence of assets. So I of course I had all these assets at different broker firms that I showed. It showed customer assets, showed my equity, it showed. Um, you know, a lot of the money that we had, so quote unquote, was in treasury bills. So it showed all of these assets, and I and I showed uh, I, the last one was probably, you know, it was about four hundred million dollars in assets. I I see. So you wanted to show that because some investors felt comfort that oh, he's a big fund, it's legit, don't worry, as correct. opposed to always being like a four million dollar fund. Exactly correct. Okay, so so again, it's not like like you you weren't living the rich life, like you even if you were pulling money, there wasn't a lot of money to pull from. You still had to like trade and invest and hire people and so on. So you weren't living the high life and you spent seven miserable years stressed out of your mind, you know, losing money and defrauding these investors. And it just got too much, you know, after the failed suicide attempt, you turned yourself in and then you got a nine-year federal prison sentence. I got a I got a nine-year sentence. Uh, my my range was eight to ten years. Um, I, and initially, we thought that I would get a five or six-year sentence um, because I you know I get that I, I get that visit uh, when I was uh, incarcerated uh, uh, at MCC here in Chicago from my attorney. Hey, do you know anybody on the floor who's committing fraud? Like, well, sure, of course I know a lot of people how they're scamming clients. 
he goes, would you, would you consider wearing a wire? And so they want, they wanted to wire me up and put a, um, uh, put a little camera in my, in my trading coat and basically watch how these guys, you know, run stops on the trading floor and how they're basically, you know, you know, bagging money, you know, go from different brokers to different traders and all that fun stuff. And, you know, also there's so much like, I don't know, like you're not really in the stock pits there, but there's so much inside information that the market makers have. Plus they're trading against customer order flow. Like there's a million that, things they're doing. That that's exactly right. And it's, and it's so easy, you know, in, in, in a, in a trading pit situation, it's so easy to, you know, for the brokers to let them know the traders where the stops are. So all they do, the traders just run the stops and you can get these huge sell orders, you know, way, way below. And, and then, you know, they're buying it and then the market comes back up and, you know, they've got all these, you know, illegal illicit profits. And it, I mean, it happened, uh, it happened every day, especially, you know, especially on num days when there's numbers coming out and you've got a lot of volatility anyway. Uh, and I, I just, you know, for some reason, although, you know, uh, the people that I, I could have kind of quote unquote ratted on, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't really particularly care for him, but I, I didn't think it was necessarily fair that I could do it. So I said, you know what, I, I really don't want to do it, you know, because at that point there, there had been no, this is maybe a week as after I was incarcerated. So nothing really had hit the, hit the wires yet. So nobody if, would have ever, ever known. If you had agreed to that, do you think you would avoid a jail time altogether? I don't think I would have avoided jail time. I probably might've gotten, you know, four or five years, mm -hmm. um, in, in, instead of my range, which, which was six to eight. Um, and I, or eight to 10 and I, I got nine years and served uh, six and a half. Yes, it's totally true. Airbnb has changed my life. If anything, they have made my life so much better. Like I used to live in Airbnbs. I, I lived in over a hundred or 200 different Airbnbs over a three-year period. And I loved it. I love, I became a really good guest of Airbnbs and I got to know lots of hosts. So when I initially owned a house, I, of course, the first thing I thought was I'm going to turn my house into an Airbnb because I travel a lot. So why leave my house unused when I can make a side income by letting others Airbnb my house or come to stay in my house as guests and having my own Airbnb or, or being a host for Airbnb has allowed me to do just that. And I've met other hosts. I've actually spoken at Airbnb's host conference. I think it was in 2017. I met so many just nice hosts. It's a great community. And I love you know, turning my own home into an Airbnb. Like I'm traveling to Austin next month. My home's going to be an Airbnb while I'm away and I'll stay in an Airbnb. I'd rather stay in like a three-story house Airbnb than in one tiny hotel room in, in the middle of Austin during South by Southwest. So listen, while you're away, your home could be an Airbnb. Many people host on Airbnb, but there are people who are just letting their house sit empty, who've never thought about it or didn't realize their space could be an Airbnb. Hosting can easily fit into your lifestyle and is a great way to earn some extra money. So if you have a home, but you're not always at home, then you have an Airbnb. Your home might be worth more than you think. Find out how much at airbnb.com slash host. Daylight savings time is starting up again. Okay, podcast is over. That's all you needed to know. But why do we have uh, daylight savings time? Answer, to give us more daylight from March through November. By setting your clocks forward, it may feel like there are more hours in the day that initial, when we initially start daylight savings. But if you're hiring, it doesn't necessarily help you find qualified candidates for your roles any sooner. There's only one way to do that, ZipRecruiter. And right now you can try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash James. ZipRecruiter works around the clock to find qualified candidates for you. Once you post your job on ZipRecruiter, they send it to 100 plus job sites so you reach more of the right people. This is such a brilliant idea for a business and ZipRecruiter did it. So ZipRecruiter's smart technology also quickly scans thousands of resumes to identify people whose skills and experience match your job. 
I've used ZipRecruiter, particularly as a potential employee, and I still, to this day, get messages every day. James Aldacher, would you like to apply to be VP of en Entertainment at NBC or whatever? So there's just nonstop emails. Like I got five or six emails today because of because a year ago I signed up for ZipRecruiter. So spring forward with a new hiring partner, ZipRecruiter, and find top talent sooner. See why four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. Just go to this exclusive web address to try ZipRecruiter for free. ZipRecruiter.com slash James. Once again, that's ZipRecruiter.com slash James. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. Wow. So nine years, that's, that is a long time. And like, what, what were you, what was going through your head when you're, well, when, you know, you got the sentence of not of eight to 10 years? Well, I'm going to take a, I'm going to take a step back real quick here. So after, so I am, I'm at my, uh, in front of the magistrate judge and refused bond. So basically, basically the, the federal courthouse is maybe four blocks away from, uh, the pretrial pre-trial holding center at the uh, Metropolitan Correctional Center in Chicago, which is literally right across the street from the board tray. I could see my office from uh, from <laughs> from my from my quote unquote room. Right. Anyway, I you know I had never been incarcerated, never, or of course, never even been to to a jail before. And I remember just going in every, every you know. Uh, there's four or five of us that at like five o'clock in the afternoon that got into the into the bus to go there and you know you go through intake and you get your you know they do a quick medical exam and all that stuff. I remember it was probably around six thirty seven o'clock. You know, taking the elevator up to where I was going to go and you know hitting that doorbell and going in. Everybody, you know, seeing everybody on on the floor, you know, playing cards and you know start you know yelling. Oh, we got a new guy on the floor and and it just. It was just really kind of surreal, and just there was a lot of fear there. But really, after kind of you know going to my room and seeing where I was going to stay, and talking with my my roommate there probably for ten minutes, I I knew I made the right decision. Um, you know, I don't say it was probably a little bit easier for me my whole prison experience than others because I wasn't married and didn't have kids. I mean, it's you know when you're in that situation, it's much much difficult. I, I wouldn't say that. I enjoyed it or had a good time, uh, but you just try to make the best that you can. Well, like, did you, did that, you that first time you're incarcerated though, like had your girlfriend broken up with you? Like what happened there? Well, I mean, she, no, she, I mean, she knew what was going to happen. I mean, she knew I was like, well, I mean, what are we going to do? I, I know I'm going to get, you know, probably a, a decent prison sentence. I mean, you, you know, we, we broke up. I mean, I, I'm not going to, you know, hold her to that. I mean, not that she would have stayed, but I mean, that wouldn't have been fair to her. So, so, is federal prison, so I don't know what it's like. Is federal prison different from other prisons? Like, was it pretty cushy, as they say? Like, it was a white collar prison? So, so where, so the MCC in Chicago, and I believe they got one in, in Brooklyn where, where Madoff stayed before he was, uh, he was actually sentenced. Um, it's there, there's, it's all security levels, right? There's murders there, there's child molesters there, there's, uh, you know, everybody who's done anything on the federal side. Typically, federal prison is a little bit, from my understanding, is a little bit easier. You get longer sentences, but it's a little bit easier in federal prison than it is uh, on the state side. Um, so I was, I was in Chicago here for two and a half years, and then I ended up going to a prison camp in Duluth, Minnesota, and I was there for four years. And which, which of course, was much different than being, you know, in Chicago. But were you mixing with the murderers and the molesters and so on? Um, well, you're, you're you're kind of you're kind of all there. I mean, you know, there there you know, there's the the rules, you know, the the big rules where you know you don't you don't mix with, um, you don't mix with either child molesters and you don't mix with someone who's been rat. Although in that situation, everybody's kind of you know in in you know is there's I think there was six or seven floors where there were uh, inmates on and you you're kind of kind of like locked in on, on the floor all all the time. So you, you you kind of you kind of talk to everybody. So it's it, it's a little bit different now. When you go to where you're going to go, um, then there's a definitely a big rule. You know, you know, you know, whites typically stay talk stay with whites, and you know, the Mexican gangs stay with that with themselves, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the the I guess the good thing about the camp was that there's no child molesters that are allowed to go there. And there are no murders, murders that are allowed to go there. Of course, there are people who did go to Max, and you know, they, oh, 
maybe they got 20 or 30 year sentences and they just worked their way down to where their security level allowed them to go to a camp. And those were probably the best inmates. You know, the, the, the guys that, that, that the white collar guys that came in off the street and and basically just, you know, turned themselves in after they were sentenced, you know, they were I say on bond. Uh, those, those were those were the worst the worst inmates at all. You know, the guys who had been, you know, locked up for a while, you know, were just really big on on the whole respect thing. And this is how you conduct yourself and we're all stuck here together. So this is how we're going to act. Um, but it's, you know, it was a, it's, it was a much different experience than I ever expected it to be. I mean, it's something like you would, that, that you'd see on TV. Now that I would see some fights and some people do some stupid things and, you know, and get checked for it really good. Um, but it was nothing like I expected it to be. Like you were, you felt safe. I mean, even when I was in Chicago, I mean, being a white collar guy, I mean, I think it's a little, it's, it, it might've been a little bit easier um, because, you know, we're able to, you know, help certain inmates if English was not their first language to write letters to their loved ones, to their lawyers, to help go over their paperwork, to help them write briefs and documents. So it, it was, it might've been a little bit easier for us. And of course, everybody was said, oh, you stole $4 million. How did you do it? And all that kind of, you know, fun stuff. But no, I, I never, I never really felt unsafe. Um, you know, I, I, yeah, I never felt unsafe. And six and a half years. So you served six and a half years. Did you like, I don't know, take classes during that time? Like, how did you improve your life during that time? Or did you just kind of wait it out? Well, so relatively early on when I was in, uh, incarcerated in Chicago, you know, I kind of thought, well, what am I, what am I going to do? I mean, I, I, I know I definitely, I'm going to be, you know, barred from the securities industry. So what am I going to do? And yeah, you really have no idea. And I go, well, you know, maybe I can tell my story. Maybe I can, you know, uh, educate people on, you know, kind of, you know, what to look out for, but nothing really concrete. And when I, when I got up to the camp up in Duluth, Minnesota, um, you know, met some, some, a few CPAs who were, you know, who were, you know, from major firms and they're like, oh my gosh, you know, you really should maybe get into consulting and do this stuff. I mean, you've got a great story and you've seen a lot of things. So they recommended, uh, you know, my family sent in a bunch of books. I interviewed uh, a bunch of other inmates who had committed crime and basically came up with about a hundred red flags that you know, either directly or indirectly lead to investment fraud. And, you know, what's interesting, James, is that, you know, what, even with the advent of the internet and everything, not, nothing's really changed. I mean, you know, the, the, the same types of, of, of mechanics and fraud are being committed today as they were in the 50s and 60s. You know, I, I, I looked at probably, you know, dozens, hundreds of cases on the, on the federal and state side that I was able to pull while, you know, while I was incarcerated. And just, you know, the same red flags, you know, are, are there today as they were, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago. Like so, what are some of the red flags? And that's that... really when I decided that I would, I, I wanted to try to make a difference in terms of preventing investment fraud. And and what are some of the red flags that just surprise you still exist today? Um. Wow. So I would say, number one, the, the biggest, the biggest problem I see is people tend to want to profile fraudsters, right? It's it's the, the whole perception is that a fraudster is the used car salesman, right? And the used car salesman is going to, you know, push to send money in and call every day, twice a day to try to get them to invest their five, 10, 15, $20,000, whatever it might be. And that, you know, and that what's interesting is that there there is no profile. I mean, it, you could take the opposite sides of the spectrum, and I'm just writing about this. I'm I'm working on a book as we speak, and you know, it was was interesting. Somebody could be you know 80 years old or 70 years old as Madoff was, or someone as you know young and attractive as an Elizabeth Holmes from Theranos, right? And you know, have everything in between in terms of education and career experience and 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 personal assets, et cetera, et cetera. And it doesn't matter who the person is. You can't you can't pigeonhole a person if they're a fraudster or not. You have to check everybody out. Um, because I, I find that most investors who lose money, most big investors will lose money to someone like a Madoff or myself, someone who is probably a little quieter, a little more introverted, kind of like, well, you know, here's the investment. If you want to invest, great. If not, great. I'll go, you know, there's plenty of other people who want to invest versus someone who is, you know, the used car salesman 
and who's pushing all the time. And yeah, a lot of people fall for that. But those are the, you know, probably the small investors, the five or ten thousand um, dollar accounts, so to speak. Um, but in terms of the investors who invest with someone like myself or a Madoff, that's where the big frauds occur because, you know, they're 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 not pushy. They're you know they they've they've crossed their T's. They they've dotted their eyes in terms of of all their documents and their and their career history, and they look a lot less uh, likely to commit fraud. So that that's probably the biggest one. And like, what two pieces of advice would you give to someone? who's doing due diligence on whether it's a fund or a company or whatever? Number one, audited financial statements. Uh, and and th this, this goes not just to verify if the individual CPA and the, and the audit firm are legitimate, because I mean, you can easily go to one of the state accounting boards and see it or go to, I believe, cpaverify.com uh, and, and check out if they're, they're valid. But the question comes in, you have a document in your hand. Did that actual CPA, did he actually perform that audit? And that is probably the hardest thing to do because I because may, maybe the CPA performed that audit in its entirety. Maybe, maybe the the operator is just pulling, you know, a name, uh, a guy's name, and I hate to use a a company name from Deloitte, right? Just pick some random num a random CPA there and puts Deloitte on there. And oh, Deloitte, oh, no problem. I don't have to check this out. Yeah, we know we know who Deloitte is. But probably the the biggest issue that I see quite often is a a, a valid CPA and firm performing an audit, and the operator going in and taking one, two, or three pages of, of financials and changing some of the numbers, adding a couple of zeros, moving up a few decimal points. So in turn, if if we were to call the CPA firm, we could verify that yes, he did that audit for that particular company, but is it the exact audit that he did? And I, I think that the biggest issue, and it, it's difficult because you know a lot of CPAs won't even confirm at times that they did the audit or that 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 a particular fund or company is their client. Um, but it's really important to get a copy from them directly of that audit. Um, because you just never know what's been changed. And sometimes you can just change one or two numbers. It's not like, you know, they're 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 massaging all the numbers, maybe just, you know, one or two numbers. And that's really all you need to, you know, to to fool people. But yeah, to your point, like the hedge fund manager could be delivering to the accountant all the bank statements, but those bank statements could be manipulated. Like, how do you check that? Well, so well, you, you really have to talk to the CPA firm. Hey, well, how do how did you get these? I mean, most CPA firms that will, that are doing audits these days are gonna are gonna get the the bank statements directly and the brokerage statements directly from the financial institutions themselves. They're not gonna they're not gonna get them from that the hedge fund operator, right? And how how do they do it? They log in to the same account that the hedge fund manager uses, or or do they call the bank and say, send me these statements? But then someone in the bank could be in collusion or the number could be fake or whatever. It, so basically the uh the the audit firm is gonna send a for for every institution is gonna is basically sending a form to the hedge fund operator that that's basically giving the firm the right to release those statements to the to the audit firm for the purposes of an audit. Now if you have individuals at the bank who are you know are in on it and helping fudge the numbers, then at that point, yeah, it's it's It'd be really, really, really tough to to find that fraud out. Although you, I haven't seen that personally. Yeah, I guess that's rare. But it it it, it would be rare. Um, yeah, I, I'm just trying to think about of a case in Chicago back in the day that um, uh, a big future for, firm that went under. But even then, no, that the statements were coming directly directly to the to the CEO, and he was he was fudging them before the CPA's got it. Yeah, but the, the CPA has to get those documents directly from the financial institutions. I think of frauds that I've seen where, for instance, one manager would take really like long dated futures with with no volume on it, and with one trade at the end of the year or the end of the month, you know, make one trade like 6,000% higher. Again, there was no volume in this market. Nobody looked at it. It was like maybe 20, 27, you know, leaps on some weird option. And, uh, and so they, he'd be able to mark up his portfolio that way. Uh, uh, and there, there was no way to like, a, uh, an audit wouldn't help. Like there was no way to, to know he was doing this manipulation. 
Well, I, and I think to, to to your point, I would even take that further and say, I think that most auditors, if they don't understand the products that they are auditing, uh, it, it makes a big difference. So for example, I my third or fourth month uh, in operation, I had a, a gentleman, uh, an investor, bring his CPA with him to come see my operation. He, this gentleman already invested with me, and I didn't know he was bringing a CPA. And um, he had he had his statements with him. He goes, I want I want to see a copy to make to see the trade that you did for these three months and make sure that they that they comply with you know what you actually traded. So I went to my file cabinet and I pulled my three monthly statements. Right, we walked. Uh, my office was actually inside of my clearing firm, and we walked to the back office and said, Hey, um, Nancy, this is a CPA. He's looking into my books. Can you pull my three monthly statements of all my trades for you know the first three months of the fund? He, she pulled them. They all they all matched, and uh, everything. You know, he he didn't recognize uh, any issue with it, other than the fact that I should have been. If if he would have understood the futures market, he would have realized, boy, you're not trading the kind of size that mm. you should be if you were, um, you know, if you were managing as much money as you said you were managing. And what was going to be your answer if he did uh, uh, understand that? Da da da. da. I, I don't know. I would have I would have had to say something. Well, you know, there's you know, I, I traded other firms and I, I did have, you know, other uh, I was using I think a total of four uh, uh, other futures commission merchants or brokerage firms to 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 do trades. And I would have had to concoct something up. Um, actually, th this was not the first year. This was actually the, the, the second year because I was actually I think I, at the time I was said I was managing. Twenty-five million dollars, or whatever I said, whatever I was managing. So, but anybody who understood the futures market, you know, I was, you know, trading. Let's just say, you know, twenty lots in the S and P's, where I should have been trading probably fifty or sixty or seventy lots, right, to to earn those kind of returns. So, I mean, really, anybody who understood that market and what the tick value is on on futures, and you could really just go in with a calculator and. And just kind of work backwards. Well, you made 1.3% this month. You needed to make this amount, but you're only trading this size. It just doesn't make sense. And so, I mean, another type of fraud that I've seen, there, there's one guy who is a multi-billion dollar legit hedge fund manager now. He's in the news almost every single day. And I remember back in 2002, 2003, he was getting in trouble because he took half of his then hedge fund. He has a different one that he started since. Half of his then hedge fund. And he just like bought like random golf courses or so, something else and uh, like that he wasn't supposed to be trading and he lost all the money and somehow he restarted and now is a multi-billion dollar hedge fund. Like, do you ever feel weird that some of these guys who should have been frauds ended up getting away with it completely and now are a hundred percent quote unquote legit and billionaires? No, I, I I really don't. You know, my 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 doing was you know between me myself and I, and I just I made a really really bad decision. I made a bad decision to not trade my original strategy, and I made a bad decision to hide it. Yeah, and, no, no, I'm I'm not saying yeah. you should have gotten away with it. I'm saying this guy, I can't stand it when I see that other guys got away with it, and. I don't know how they did it. It was just like out of charisma or some weird factor that they weren't that everybody knew what they were doing, but they weren't. I don't know. Maybe I'm I'm just talking randomly, but I'm thinking of one guy in particular who's famous hedge fund manager now. And I'm thinking like I always wonder like how did he avoid not going to jail when it was public knowledge what what he did. He even had to shut his fund down and the whole thing, and then he survived. Well, it you know, it probably wasn't it probably wasn't criminal. I mean, you know, it it would probably mm -hmm. just be he probably he probably was sued civilly. I I can't imagine if he lost that much money and he had to close the fund at a loss. If if he was trading or if he well if he was trading or buying assets uh, that were not specifically disclosed in his in his hedge fund documents, um, I mean that that would be considered potentially fraudulent and it's a civil it's a civil offense. So he probably was sued. So in in, in terms of him, uh, he probably wouldn't have been. Um, prohibited from starting another fund. Um, and if, if he was that charismatic in terms of raising money, I mean, raising money is raising money, right? He probably has a pretty big network and, you know, was able to do it and do really well. Yeah, no, I know. I, the more I think about it, the more I'm thinking of examples of this type of thing where it was just, they got away I mean, with like what I would consider a, a abhorrent behavior 
and and somehow survived and and you know lived to be even bigger. I mean, you know, I just remember from the day when I was an apps manager, uh, and you know, there was a there was not so much on our desk, but on on the institutional desk right next to me, there was you know a bunch of of hedge funds on there and names I'm sure that you would recognize. And there was situations where we had to kind of move trades that were losers for a couple of days, especially going from the end of one month and the beginning of the other month. So they go from, you know, from error account A to error account C to error account, you know, L. Uh, and then the next month we move back into, into their error account, which we could hold it until the end of the month again. And I remember, you know, even for some of our clients that we had to do that. And that's just kind of in terms of moving stuff around. Um, that's kind of how I even thought about, well, you know, I'll, I'll trade in my own account and I can, I can move the losers into my personal account and take the winners from my personal account and move them to, um, you know, to that of the fund. So I, I was doing it just the opposite. Most most fund managers or, or, or traders who who are managing investor capital, they're they're taking all the winning trades from the fund and putting them into their personal account, right? And vice versa. I was doing just the opposite. I was taking the losers from the fund and putting them in, into my individual account, right? And then all, all the winners from my individual account were getting moved over to uh, to the hedge fund account. So yeah, it was it was it was awful. Looking for a rewarding, life-changing opportunity that enhances the lives of children in your community? Well, with almost 50 years of experience, Huntington Learning Center is the nation's leading K-12 tutoring and test prep franchise dedicated to shaping brighter futures for both students and franchisees. Huntington is the top revenue-producing supplemental education franchise in the U.S., and their proven system is the key to success for you and your students. The Huntington Advantage includes low startup cost, turnkey systems, dedicated support teams, national and local marketing support, and multiple revenue streams to help you build a life-enriching and profitable business. No education experience needed. In today's environment, the need for tutoring has never been greater. When you become part of Huntington Learning Center, you're filling an urgent need in the growing $5 billion supplemental education industry. To learn more, Visit HuntingtonFranchise.com. Make a meaningful difference. Pursue your dreams of business ownership and be a positive force in your community. Don't wait. Visit HuntingtonFranchise.com today. Hey, listen, men's health is important. Men act all cocky and like they don't need anything. But the reality is, as you get older, there's some things you need. And it often feels like we're too busy to take care of our health problems. Like, I'd rather do anything than go to the doctor or the dentist or the pharmacy or whatever. But now you don't have to waste your time if you use HIMS. HIMS, H I M S, HIMS is changing men's health care by providing simple and convenient access to science backed treatments for erectile dysfunction hair loss, weight loss, and more. The entire process is 100% online, so you get a new routine of improving your overall health faster. Jay, you listening to all this? Yes, I'm definitely going to use him for now. Not on. that you need it. You're, you're young and healthy. James, I'm 35. You, you're getting there. You might, you might need it. Who knows? But if prescribed, your medication ships directly to you for free and indiscreet packaging. No insurance is needed. You can manage your plan on the HIMSS app, track progress, and learn more about your conditions and how to treat them from leading medical experts. Start your free online visit today at hymns.com slash James. Could you imagine that there's a whole section just with my name on it? Hymns.com slash James. That's how I how much I am representative of the kind of person who needs hymns. That's H-I-M-S dot com slash James for your personalized treatment options. Hymns.com slash James. Prescriptions require an online consultation with a healthcare provider who will determine if appropriate. Restrictions apply. See hymns.com slash James for details and important safety information. Subscription required. Price varies based on product and subscription plan.
honestly, I don't think I would ever trust a hedge fund at this point, not because of this conversation, but just in general, I've told people I don't really trust hedge funds because you just never really know because, because it's not possible for like a small individual to do the kind of due diligence you're talking about. You're just kind of like going on. Maybe if something was run by like the, you know, BlackRock or something like that, then okay, it's probably legit, but it's just hard to trust. And that's why I guess the hedge fund business, the hedge fund industry in general has become more institutionalized because I would never trust certainly a small hedge fund anymore. Yeah, well, it, it, it's really tough. And I would say uh, in terms of, you know, th that's why the audits are, are so important because, you know, audits mean a lot of things to a lot of people. But in terms of hedge funds, I mean, do the assets, assets exist? Are they real, right? Is it cash? Is, you know, are they in securities? What, where, are, where are they at? How are they valued? If they're not marked to market, right? If it's not being traded, how are they marked to market? And, and number three, how are they custodied? And a, a lot of ones now are are basically, you know, being, checking the, um, the the monthly performance returns to making sure that they are being computed correctly as well. You know how how they are marked is a huge issue because take a private equity fund or or take a pipe fund where they get uh, locked up shares at a discount. Are they valuing them at the discount even though the shares are locked up? Or they or did they get them at the discount and then mark them at full value just so they get their fees on them? Like. And accountants go along with it. Like accountants go along with what, whatever the manager says in many cases. Well, and a big reason is that because the accountants don't even know. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there, there's a there's a Ponzi scheme that I'm investigating as we speak. And, um, you know, it's a multifamily, a big multifamily. Uh, it looks like it could be $25, $30 million. And, you know, I'm having a problem, you know, looking at the valuations and, and some of what, what the stuff should be valued at. And, and a lot of times the CPAs don't know or they'll, you know, they'll even go to the fund manager and say, which, you know, which give me a range of what this should be worth that gives them something that they can kind of work back on and support. Because a lot of times, I mean, it would just be ungodly expensive, James, for these guys to come in and 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 figure it out. And 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 multifamily and property uh real estate is much easier than you know some of some of these other derivatives that are out there. I mean, stuff that trades on an exchange that's marked to market is, I mean, it's it's a no-brainer, right? That's the easiest the easiest, you know, uh, uh, piece to evaluate. But in terms of the other stuff, it's really difficult. And these CPs just, you know, just pull their hair out trying to evaluate some of the stuff. So, so you get out of jail and like, did you actually start getting hired to be a fraud investigator or like what happened? So probably three, four months after I was released. So I was released in July of 17. I started just doing a bunch of just kind of, free talks telling my story to, you know, local chamber I'm, I'm, uh, in outside of Chicago. So uh, Chambers of Commerce, Rotary, et cetera, et cetera. And within the first three or four months of doing those talks, um, there was a, a a law firm that was uh, a, a few of the partners were at heard my talk. And we talked a couple of times and actually they, they give me a lot of consulting business to, to you know, come in and 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 pick up the pieces, which I really kind of don't like. I, I'm I really I'm trying to make the move and be more on the proactive side, be on the preventative side. Of course, you know, a, a lot of investors sometimes don't see how important it is that it, it's better to pay up front, uh, you know, a fee to have somebody come in and do the due diligence rather than you know pick up the pieces and try to find out where the money's at. Yeah, or I wonder even within. Like I wonder, does do insurance companies get involved in this at all? Or um, you know, not not so much. Um, you know, I would say probably my my last three clients have been ex uh, ex professional athletes, and that's the area that I really want to really want to focus on. Actually, there's athlete that uh, there's an athlete that is invested in this multifamily, and you know, probably in his career, he probably only made fifteen twenty million dollars. So you can, you know, after taxes and after paying all the fees to his, you know, business manager and agent, you can imagine what's what's left of that. And he invested about six hundred thousand dollars. So that's a big piece of his, of 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 what he had left. And uh, he's probably going to lose most of it, if not all of it. And you know, uh, a lot of these ex-athletes just get crushed in terms of, you know, uh, ideas and you know, business propositions from their family and friends. But also, you know, from their agents and managers, and not that there's there's malintent involved. You know, the, what's interesting, and I just can't say this enough: most most professionals don't know how to evaluate these types of of, of private investments. Um, yeah, so you should market yourself like this to sports agents. Like, do you know David Meltzer? 
Uh, I know, and I've seen, I see him on Facebook quite a bit. Yeah, because uh, I do know personally. He's been on the podcast, and I've been on his show. Uh, Jay, who's who's the producer here, he's listening. Jay, can you introduce James to David Meltzer? Send an email introducing the two of them, and you should meet him because he deals with a lot of clients. And I've seen I've seen some sports. But who is that guy? He's got the same name as like Clinton's old lawyer, and he was doing a Ponzi thing and went to jail for a long time. And he was investing primarily athletes' money. I think I remember before I was revealed he was a fraud. I was trying to raise money from him, and he was like, "Why should I invest with you? I return like double what you return." And it turns out like all his returns were fraud. So horrible. Yeah, uh, it's and it's a, it's it's a shame. It's it's a shame that you know I I, I always you know kind of end what my presentations with you know the 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 story. You know my my fraud lasted for literally eight years, and you know my high net worth clients performed due diligence themselves, uh, or they they farmed it out to their um, you know to their attorneys and their CPAs and IRA independent trust companies and bank trust officers. Uh, their offices dot the downtown skyline in Chicago. And what were the results? That my fraud lasted for eight years. That either, and and really, either they didn't do the work, James, or they just didn't know what to look for. And I think I think that's probably the bigger part of my story. You know, I, I, I do a lot of continuing education talks for, you know, audit firms and, and law firms. They want to hear my story. And look, my story is great. This is what I did. I, I'm, I'm open and honest. There's no question I will not answer. And this is what I'm doing now, and that's all great. But I think the bigger picture is how could someone like me, you know, fool so many people for so long? And the, the thing is, is I didn't fool anybody. Nobody, nobody did the right amount of due diligence to to find my fraud. Anybody, you know, who, you know, if, if it was me investing my fraud, I, I wouldn't have find out found out the first hour of, of of doing, you know, the analysis. And do you ever run into any old investors and, you know, are they upset at you? So, well, you know, I've talked, I reached out to all of them and I've sat with, uh, of my, um, so I would say of my 62 investors, I've sat with probably at 12 or 13. And, you know, I, I just kind of want to let them know, well, of course, apologize profusely, but just to kind of let them know, it, it wasn't like I took their money and like I was like jet setting in a private jet all over the place. And I think that's what a lot of people don't realize. And I'm just going to, I'm not going to say it's with with all fraudsters, but definitely with myself. You know, I, I really compare it to if you've seen the movie Scarface with Al Pacino. And, you know, you, you see all of this heartache and you see this in, in the middle of the film, there's like that two minute montage. And I can't remember the song they play, push it to the limit maybe, right? And he's getting married and he's driving the car and they show the house and it's all of his smiles and laughs and all that stuff. And the rest of the movie is just kind of like depressing, right? And shows the struggles that he's had, that he has. And that that's, I, I really can't say that enough, how how difficult it was that knowing that that this is on my back and that people that that people should find out every day and just walking in the I mean just go, being on the on the trading floor right and seeing a couple you know you'll see a guy or two you know walk on the floor with you know with dark suits and white shirts oh my god is that the FBI is that the SEC is that the Tomorrow Futures Trading Commission I mean it just living like that was was just pure hell and I think a lot of people don't realize that um and of course you know some clients you know don't want to meet and you know I can I can respect that you know, absolutely. I, I think um, and I might be pushing the limit here a little bit. I think most of the individuals who don't want to meet with me really realize that they could have done the due diligence and found out early on that I was a fraud. Um, yeah. I, 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 first off, obviously you're at fault and you went to jail for it and you're not denying that, but I a hundred percent blame the clients for investing in you as well. Well, so I, so I, I can't because because of my story, I can't blame them. Um, although I, you know, in my talks, when I when I talk to you know investor groups, you know, I have a very I have a big tough love message. You know, one of my biggest former investors, one of my biggest fans on the internet, um, just lambastes me, and I and I get it. I understand he's upset, even 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 to this day. But understand that this person was a former investigative reporter for the Chicago Tribune in work, and after that. Um, he he left to work for a major major corporate security firm in Chicago, where and he was on location at Walmart and a lot of places. I mean, this hasn't this guy has an investigative, you know, DNA, right? 
And, you know, he was on the floor numerous times and we had spent, you know, many, many lunches and dinners together over the years. And, you know, a lot of these guys asked the right questions, but, you know, they they just didn't know how to verify the truth. And, and that would be probably the biggest thing. You know, everybody, you know, you see these these documents and, and, and marketing pieces and all that kind of stuff. And that's all great, right? Even, you know, even, and I want to get into this for a minute on the financial advisor misconduct, financial advisor fraud, you know, even like the RIAs that, that you know, they have their, you know, their their documents required by the SEC. I mean, anybody can write anything they want in there. The question is, is going in there and, and proving, are they doing what they say they're doing? And that's probably the the hardest, the hardest piece. To do to, to to verify, are are they doing what they say that they're doing? And a lot of times, though, hedge funds will say, "Listen, um, this information is proprietary." Like if you're investigating, for instance, you know intricacies of a deal they do, like not not again, like the vanilla hedge funds that just buy and sell stocks, but they're doing more complicated deals. They might or 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 they're trading some esoteric derivatives, and they might say this information to investors: "This information is proprietary. We we don't give it out." What do you do about those situations when you're doing due diligence? Um, so, so when I'm when I'm hired, it's one of two things, right? Uh, I, I get one of two phone calls. It's some, either somebody, hey, I've got this 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 hedge fund or this private equity or whatever it may be that I want to invest in. I've got all the documents. You know, what would you charge to you know to do it? I you know I'll look I'll look through it and we'll have a conversation. And yeah, and the manager knows that somebody's going to call him and he's more than happy to talk to you, right? So that that's relatively easy. On the other side. You know, you know, James, I, I invested in this hedge fund or this whatever, this private company, you know, a year ago. Now I'm making a lot of money. There's no problems, right? But you know, that the statements are coming a little bit late now. And when I call, if I email or call and leave a message, it takes them a week to get back to me. Now I'm not concerned, but I need you to go in and 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 you know, kick it around and, and see what you can find. But definitely don't let anybody know that you're that you're, you know, you're you're do, doing due diligence on them and don't mention my name. And that's where it gets a little bit difficult. But to go back to what you said in terms of, of both hedge funds, I mean, look, I don't necessarily need to see the positions. I don't want to, I don't want to see your strategy. I don't want to see your positions. I mean, even if I can only verify your 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 back office, how is your back office working? How is that structure working? And and even though there may not be fraud going on, so even if if a particular fund or a particular management company is absolutely clean you know is there is there back office infrastructure is it prone to potential fraud in the future you know how are the separation of duties is there a, a third party that's in there that that uh, administrator that's handling a lot a lot of those uh transactions that's handling the money in money out that's doing all of it that's computing the numbers and what does that look like? Because, you know, even, you know, Madoff wouldn't let people for a long time, although I I, I have copies of some of the, of the audits that he actually had, had done or not he done, but his, his firm, uh, his accounting firm did. And they were very, I mean, they were very minuscule at the very least. Um, you know, there, there's nothing, Looking at somebody's back office, there's no intellectual property there. There, there. There's no edge that if I know how your back office works, I'm going to be able to, you know, you know, front front run your orders, right? Because I I don't even need, right. need to know what you're trading. I mean, I'll, yeah, I guess I wonder what you're trading, but you know what I mean. I don't need I don't need to see all of that to. Uh, I just need to see your back office and how it's set up. Let, let let's go there, and then you know we I can make a a, a better decision. But it's just it, it's just amazing how many you know how many investors will just kind of you know stop short of that. Man, James Randolino, we you gave given me so much to think about, and sounds like your six and a half years in jail were more satisfying life experience than the six and a half years prior to that, where you were just dealing with this hell of committing fraud and well, keeping it going and so on. Yeah. You know, I hope I don't get in trouble by saying this. I'm not sure if I've ever said it on a podcast before. Um, but, you know, if, if look, I I wish I would have made different decisions, right? I wish I would have had the right. guts to tell my clients that, you know, what was actually going on, but I didn't and things happened for what they happened. And, I, you know, I, I say now that, you know, if, if I would have known how, my experience was in federal prison, how it actually turned out to be, I would have turned myself in 
long before I did. Um, you know, it, it, it was just a, you know, for me, it was just a, it, it was just a big kind of timeout that, you know, I'm able to, you know, really, you know, handle mental health issues and really see what, you know, what do I, what am I going to do now that I can't go back to the industry that I spent my, you know, my entire career wanting to, you know, you know, wanting to be in, what am I going to do now? How can I make a real difference? How can I make, you know, amends with, you know, with my investors? How can I, you know, how can I make a real difference in in quantitatively uh, reducing the amount of victims and, and the amount of fraud that's going on? And so then, I, since getting out of jail, like when you first started, like, I don't know, dating again, was it a problem that you were in jail for all these years? Like, how did you get over that hurdle? Um, it, it was a long time. I just started dating really uh, probably uh, probably a couple, a year and a half ago or so. So, you know, it's with, with my schedule, it's it's been really, really tough. Um, you know, it, it, what, what's interesting is that, you know, when I when I do a lot of it, my live speaking events, you know, I'll get, you know, people come up to me and say, it's like, boy, if I wasn't married, I would, you know, I'd want to date you because, you know, I, I really respect with, you know, what you're doing and, you know, and you're really turning your life around. So it's just a matter of, you know, just meeting the right person. But it's it, it it's definitely a. It, it, and it's definitely been a showstopper as well. I mean, so for some people, it's a little bit more baggage than than they want, and and yeah. and and I, and I accept that. You know, I just you know my my focus. You know, whether it's somebody that I'm dating or my former investors or somebody who just doesn't you know like me or want to do business, that's great because my focus is on you know on my clients and making sure that they don't invest in anything that that's going to be toxic, uh, and they're going to where they face a a total or partial loss of the assets. Well. James Brandolino, thanks, you know, so much for for coming on the show and sharing this really intense story, uh, and and being so forthright and honest about it. And and I hope the work that you're doing now succeeds in saving people a lot of a lot of money because I I believe I still think there's a lot of fraud out there. Like you said, it never stops, it never changes. And this is an important message. Like investing is not simple, and there's a lot of there's a lot of things against you, not just the markets, which could be against you also, but but all these other situations like these frauds or 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 there's a lot of things where I call like near frauds where you know everything's disclosed, but it's in the fine print and it's and it's really unethical behavior is occurring, even if it might might not be labeled as fraud fraud. So so yeah, keep I mean good it, work. It's hard enough for investors to make money, you know, with legitimate investments. And I think most investors are are more concerned about the 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 quality of the investment itself and can it earn the 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 type of returns that the operator says it is. And that's kind of where they focus it on. They don't focus on, you know, does fraud occur? If fraud occurs yeah. or will it occur? So yeah. Well, thanks again and 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 good luck. And when you have a book, come back on uh come back on the show. We'll we'll talk about all the all the types of frauds there are. Thank you, James. Thanks, James. Take care. NetCredit is here to say yes, because you're more than a credit score. Apply in minutes and get a decision as soon as the same day. Loans offered by NetCredit or lending partner banks and serviced by NetCredit. Application subject to review and approval. Learn more at netcredit.com slash partners. NetCredit, credit to the people. Want the same expert advice you get from the pros in the store while shopping online at DiscountTire.com? Meet Treadwell, your personal online tire guide that matches you with the perfect tire for your vehicle. Get your best match in one minute or less with Treadwell by Discount Tire.